speaker, Christine Morgan. She is amazing. I am, I just know you're going to love her talk. Let me introduce Christine to you. She's a historian and web series creator from Charlotte, North Carolina. She has an MA in European history, and she has been invited to present her research internationally at history conferences in the U.S. and the U.K. She's going to be at TudorCon, too, so plug for that. <laughs> her research covers the history of royal families, royal mistresses, religion, theater, and propaganda. Her web series, Untitled History Project, which she writes, researches, and hosts, has garnered support in her community and has been used as teaching material in high schools and universities in the U.S. The series features interviews with premier historians and authors. She appears regular, regularly as an historian and pop culture commentator on Charlotte's morning show, WCCB News Rising, and has written blogs for popular online platforms such as Anglotopia and History of Royal Women. She is currently expanding her thesis into a book about royal mistresses and power. So we're going to learn more about Mary Boleyn and royal mistresses here in this discussion. I'm so thrilled to introduce you to Christine Morgan. So that's great. What can you tell me about Mary Boleyn to start with? Because she is so often just put into this container of the mistress or the whore or whatever. So tell me, you know, kind of the biographical sketch, but then we're going to start debunking some myths about her and talking about her, her power and everything. Absolutely. And there's a lot of debunking to be done. Um, yeah, Mary is um, essentially, in a nutshell, she is the older sister, we think, of Anne Boleyn. Um, so the Boleyn name is strong and popular. And I think that's why people are um, kind of shadow interested in her. Mm -hmm. um, but her life is is largely undocumented, which of course gives room for historical fiction to have a little fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people get a little bit nervous talking about Mary too, because you know a lot of it is theory. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can place it in factual um, documents, sources, eyewitness accounts, yeah. um, it becomes a little less scary. The, the importance of Mary is to put her in context, um, what other women are doing, how other women are successful. Um, and I kind of love, I, I love the word whore in reference to her. It is the best propaganda campaign ever. <laughs> We're still talking about her like that in 2019. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot to be um, unraveled about Mary. Uh, and she's in France and she's in England and it's in the middle of the Reformation and there's more than one husband and, you know, it's just juicy. <laughs> so, I mean, what do we know about her? We do know about her um, that she is uh, working in court. She's in France, in French court in um, 1514. We do know about her first and second marriage, the first in 1520 to William Carey, the second in 1534 to William Stafford. Um, we do know that the idea of her as a royal mistress exists in both France and England. Um, we know that there are some reform leanings. Okay. And in general, we know that she served her sister while her sister was queen, at least briefly. Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that she's in service to Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, um, at a couple different points in time. So her existence is undocumented, but when we do find her, she is at court and okay. she's in the middle of it. Right. Okay. So let's talk about her in uh, France to start with. And this rumor that she was the king's mistress. Hmm. Alison Weir in her fiction book on Anne Boleyn played that interestingly, almost making it seem like it wasn't always consensual. And she hmm. took some, so what, what do we know about that? And yeah, this is so tricky, Heather. This is such a great 
uh, point in Mary's life. And, and the way that I kind of approach this particular moment is to consider it in a larger perspective for Mary. Um, when do we know she's in France at court? Um, how do we know the makeup, the demographic of French court? How is that changing at this time? Um, we know that French court is licentious. It's written about by multiple people. Why? Um, and then the idea that the idea that Mary is somehow removed from France, and we also don't know why. And there are a couple of reasons that it could be, uh, and one of those theories is perhaps she tried to elevate her status unsuccessfully mm -hmm. and had to leave France um, after a failed affair, something like that. Um, but if you, if you consider the makeup of French court, we know that French court has a lot of gaps the primary documents are really, really difficult, but we do know that under Queen Claude, um, she is employing the most women that have ever been employed at French court. So there's this idea that all the men at French court have no idea what to do with all these women and what to do with themselves around all these women. Um, and this is kind of where the licentious, um, the licentious word comes in. Yeah. And it, the idea that it was so hard to police the romantic relationships at French court that they became an unspoken rule that as long as you don't um, t kiss and tell, okay. as long as you don't create waves, as long as no one finds out, you're kind of free to do whatever you want. Okay. So the idea that maybe Mary overstepped her boundaries there, something happened with the French king, who was a womanizer, we know that. Um, it's not totally outside the realm of possibility, but the fact that no one addresses it for 20 years, yeah. and, it, and when it is addressed, it's part of um, um, putting down Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn's marriage. Right. It makes it very propaganda-like. Right. So when we look at that source, which I believe is um, Rodolfo Pio, who says that, um, that the king had known her while she was in France. If we look at that, the timing of it, the context of it, it's awfully suspicious. Okay. So if no one's talking about it for 20 years, Mm -hmm. And if that was the reason she was removed from court, it would be unusual for Henry VIII to have then taken her as a mistress. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, to have been the mistress of two kings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sold, but, but you can't possible. discount it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sold, though. Yeah, and maybe she got into some other kind of trouble in the French court that wasn't necessarily with the king. That's totally possible. Uh, we definitely know her sister's there too. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like to say that Anne was smarter than Mary. Again, unsubstantiated. How would we know that? Um, but maybe, maybe Anne's being really successful at court. Maybe she's being elevated faster mm -hmm. um, in some circles and Mary's not. You know, it could be anything like that. Yeah. So, so um, I'm looking, so what was, yeah, I want to talk about the difference between what court was like in France and then when she came back and was in England, um, mm -hmm. what that difference would have been for her. And yeah. For women in the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question because when people talk about Mary, they talk about her possible relationship with Francis, mm -hmm. but they don't look at um, the French court itself, the way it's functioning, and how that might have influenced the way that Mary gains autonomy and agency. Mm -hmm. And French court at this period, you know, this is continental Europe. It is. Um, they're getting a lot of information a lot faster, especially in terms of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And we know that the two um, most elevated women at court are Queen Claude and uh, her sister-in-law, Margaret of Angoulême, who eventually becomes Queen of Navarre, so Marguerite of Navarre. Um, 
you could use either term and it would be correct. Um, and both of them are known reformers. Mm -hmm. If we consider the idea that we don't necessarily know that Mary wasn't at French court because French documents are so spotty, it's possible she was there. Um, then the women serving as ladies in waiting at French court for Queen Claude or Marguerite d'Angoulême are going to be reading works by Christine de Paisan, mm -hmm. Giovanni Boccaccio, mm -hmm. um, works that elevate women into positions of power. They're also going to be um, in social circles that might include people like Erasmus, early thinkers like that. Um, so it's not totally outside the realm of possibility that Mary is in these early salons or at least hearing them mm -hmm. um, or witnessing their growth. If we talk about reform as well, the way that um, Marguerite uh, really latches onto reform, not Protestantism, reform, right. <laughs> reform of the Catholic Church, um, with those really early 95 theses. Um, it's early enough that Mary isn't in England yet, to our knowledge. Mm -hmm. She's in France. And even if she's not at court, she's going to be hearing about these events. Yeah. Um, so if she is at court, she's reading, she's learning, she's listening, and she's developing her own ideas central to a core point of women in France, which is that women are able to rule. Women can have some agency in a royal circle. Yeah, and it's interesting that difference between women in France who could not officially be queens on their own, couldn't inherit, mm -hmm. and yet they seem to have so much more power as sometimes as regents rather than regnants or I, yeah, and it seems like like Marguerite was doing the negotiations for her brother when he was captured, and you know the then you think later later on the ladies' piece that was you know these women that were trying to organize things because the men couldn't do it, and it just seems like there was this difference in that in England there wasn't any law prohibiting a woman from inheriting, and yet her role was almost so much it wasn't as I don't know what I'm trying to say. Can you finish my sentence? <laughs> um, are you trying to touch in like uh, on the idea that the women have the ability to influence without going through a male counterpart? Yeah. As much as if you're looking at like Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII or, um, you know, Elizabeth of York and Henry Tudor, it's sort of like you got to get the approval before you're yeah. moving forward. And yet in England, there wasn't any kind of law saying that women could, you would expect, I would expect, thinking about the way the laws were, that women in France wouldn't have the same kind of power. And yet they almost seem to have more, I suppose. Yeah. You could say. And I wonder too, if that's maybe a geographical um, influence. There are women ruling in other parts of Europe. This is, yeah. this is a unique moment in history where everything's in upheaval. Women are in positions of power. Uh, paving the way, they are writing, they are um, putting money into authors and artists, uh, people that they want to be patrons of. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really active on the continent. And I just wonder if geographically that's part of the split. Yeah, yeah, possibly. It just is one of those things that kind of strikes me sometimes that in a country where the women weren't even allowed to inherit, they seem to have so much more power sometimes. It's true. I totally agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah. But this is where we see the differences in French court, which is a little more open-minded, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. English court, which you're going to find being very conservative, mm -hmm. even up until the 1530s, really. Yeah, yeah. So then, I guess, talk to me about what reform meant for for the French and for yeah. the, you know, this whole reform movement that didn't necess that that wasn't Protestant at all. They wanted to just reform the Catholic Church. Explain that to me a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, French is very Catholic, and at this point, um, England still is too. There's not really a need for them to break from Rome. They get a lot of uh, power from Rome, especially. Um, but I think if we were to keep it in the framework of women and what women are saying 
in France about the Reformation, you can really see a, a good pattern of thought that emerges in the idea of you don't have to pray um, through the Virgin Mary or through, you know, your priest or your cardinal. You can have a personal relationship with God that um, circumvents traditional avenues of um, discussion and conversation. So the idea that you can go pray in your home and you don't have to do it at church, this is your kind of the idea of your sola fidei, right? You're by faith alone, which is definitely a Martin Luther um, mm -hmm. phrase. So the idea of a personal relationship is really what people latch on to at this point. Mm, interesting. So you talk then about, well, let me see, let's move her now to England. Now mm -hmm. she's she's going to England. We aren't sure why she's it yeah. been called. Maybe it was, you even said it, perhaps there was like a, a illnesses or something that she was trying to. Mm -hmm. It's possible being the older daughter um, that it was necessary for Thomas Boleyn to remove his eldest from um, France at a time when there was sort of an outbreak of the plague. Mm -hmm. um, although the fact that he left his other daughter there makes <laughs> that again I don't a little care about confusing. you. <laughs> it's a little you confusing. Like. <laughs> You'll be fine, and it'll, it'll build up your immune system. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, could you imagine? Uh, well, she did survive this wedding sickness, right? So maybe, you know. <laughs> you might be on something there. You could probably write a good essay about that. Uh, she up in France. So yeah, maybe that was part of it. Okay, but for whatever reason, she's back in England. She's carrying these ideas of women and women's power and reform and all of that that England hasn't yet had been exposed to very much. And she catches the eye of the king. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about how that developed? This is, this is really interesting too, um, because a lot of people don't know that um, Mary Boleyn actually shows up in England at the end of 1519. A lot of people think it's 1520, right before her marriage, mm -hmm. um, but her name actually shows up on a document that says there are multiple ladies Boleyn eating mm -hmm. breakfast at court in uh -huh. England. So we can place her um, in England court, October, November, 1519. Um, and you're right, she's bringing these ideas. She marries a man uh, named William Carey. So you could probably pretty accurately assess that either she returns to England so that her husband can marry her off, or her father can marry her off, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, and so when she appears, it's part of the courtship, a couple mm -hmm. of months to plan a wedding. Mm -hmm. But it's not just any wedding. Um, William Carey has recently been elevated into King Henry VIII's uh, privy chamber. He's a knight of the body. Mm -hmm. um, he is elevated in court and he is related to Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. So it is um, an important wedding that establishes Boleyn access to the Privy Chamber with William Carey. And it proves that they have power and pull at court by marrying into an extension of the royal family. And so then that brings me to a question about these factions, because you write about the factions at court mm -hmm. and developing. Um, can you explain a little bit about what was going on and the politics of that? Oh, this is so, so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's complicated because you have warring families, families that, that are intent on just absolute destruction of other powerful families. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're putting people in one of two places, the privy chamber, which is the people who wait on Henry VIII every day, the people who hang out after hours and gamble and have a drink and have his ear, or the people in the privy council who are... Um, who are making laws and treaties and they are suggesting um, diplomacy ideas mm -hmm. and both of those positions especially at the court of henry the eighth are incredibly influential henry the eighth really enjoys surrounding himself with his friends mm -hmm. people he thinks he can trust and so there is this push and pull between the old traditional factions of um, tudor court 
Plantagenet court. And then um, the new things like new men, new money, new titles, going to his younger friends. And that, of course, threatens the older, more established powers that be, including people like Cardinal Wolsey. So for Mary Boleyn to marry into the royal family and take on a husband in the privy chamber while her father is an ambassador mm -hmm. uh, and have the king attend her wedding, by the way, mm. this is a really huge moment. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really is going to make the Boleyns perfectly positioned for influence. And not only that, but the factional families start to understand, and this includes the Howards, the Howard family, that women are able to subtly influence because nobody expects it of them. Mm -hmm. So if you've right. got Mary coming in with these ideas and she's marrying someone on the inside, who's to say she's not going to use her influence? Right. And then we see her, she makes an appearance at the Chateau Vert pageant right yeah and was she extending her influence at that point do we know or not what was she with henry by that point or what's the timeline for me i think that this is a good place to pinpoint at least the start of a relationship between mary boleyn and henry the eighth a lot of people uh don't agree with me on this but hear me out <laughs> Um, so this particular pageant takes place at a diplomatic event. This is a diplomatic event between England and Spain, and it's hosted by Cardinal Wolsey. So this is a really weird trifecta of power. It's not like this play is happening for fun, just mm -hmm. at court. Yeah. It's happening in front of an international audience where Henry VIII is certainly trying to prove that he is effective and powerful. Mm -hmm. What people don't ever really talk about with this pageant is that um, there is a song that exists that details the action of the pageant. So a lot of people will say, oh yeah, it existed March of 1522, but they'll leave out the fact that it's a massive diplomatic event. And if you look at the song that is attributed to this production, we know that one of the main characters that is mentioned is the character of kindness mm -hmm. based on Edward Hall's Chronicle and Richard Gibson's costume and wardrobe accounts. We know that Mary Boleyn plays the role of kindness. You could argue that um, it's not significant because sure other women are definitely um, put in starring roles of pageants. But there are different um, things to consider here, including the fact that Henry VIII is a part of the pageant, it is a royal display, but also his sister, Mary Tudor, is a part of this pageant, and she is not the lead character. Mm. So if we want to talk about making a public display, mm -hmm. Mary Boleyn is in the spotlight in the middle of a diplomatic event that involves Henry VIII and does not include putting a spotlight on his sister. Mm -hmm. It's well, not could that have also been wrong. because his sister had been married to the French king and they did, and this was a diplomatic event with Spain or? I don't think so. I mean, she certainly has remarried. Um, and the idea of elopement, by the way, certainly yeah. influences ideas about Mary Boleyn too. Yeah. Um, but the French king that she was married to has passed. It's not, it's not a diplomatic tension there. Okay. Um, but it is a problem for Henry VIII who has to prove to the Spanish diplomats who are aligned with his wife, Catherine of Aragon, okay. that he is loyal to her. Okay. Um, and that he is creating an alliance based on their relationship. Okay. So for him, he plays the role of um, loyalty, we think. Okay. And so that's propaganda in and of itself. Right. So it really says something, it really does say something, that Mary is playing kindness in this particular position at this event. Mm. So that's in 1522. Yeah. Um, when, it, so let's talk about her daughter, um, Catherine. Okay. And when was she born and why do we think, why do you think that she was Henry's daughter? So. Catherine is born in 1524. Uh, mm -hmm. 
which is, you know, just a year and some after when we think her affair has started, 1522. Okay. Um, and we are not sure if she's his daughter. Um, obviously, again, there are some accounts that really wreck those theories because they're said under um, propaganda-like circumstances. Right. But with Catherine, there are some really unique circumstances that I think lend themselves to consideration. Okay. Can't prove it. We would have to exhume, and we just we're not going to do that. Yeah. But there are some really interesting things that happen with Catherine, including the fact that she is uh, placed in court um, as a lady in waiting for Anne of Cleves, which is certainly a position of favor, which no one would have expected from Henry VIII, considering he had already beheaded Anne Boleyn and gone through another wife. Right. Um, but he does. He takes care of her, puts her in court. Um, she's also very close with Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth I pays for this really regal, almost royal burial ceremony for her funeral. Mm -hmm. It's described as opulent. There's a lot of money that goes into this funeral. Uh, and also for her brother, Henry. Um, but interestingly, when we were opening files that had to do with burial records, Catherine Carey's burial record appears in a file that only includes royals. Mm. So, is it possible it was misfiled? Sure. But I think it is certainly telling that we find Catherine Carey in a file with the burial records of other royal men and women, kings and queens, not just nobility, right. but kings and queens. Um, so that's certainly an interesting thing to consider. Um, and additionally, she is painted by a very similar painter or the same painter, actually, that Elizabeth I commissions. They're painted similarly, and they look very similar. Um, so if you kind of throw all of that together, it becomes a little more likely mm -hmm. that Henry VIII is providing for, taking care of, and then Elizabeth I is as well, for Catherine. Yeah. She was married then, though, so how could they know? It's such a good, it's so good. The thing I think that we have to look to is with Henry VIII, he has a pattern um, of the types of women that he has affairs with. Right. He's a serial monogamist. He has lots of um, royal affairs, but they all last quite a while. Yeah. It's not like he's known for having women in and out of his bedroom every night, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, so if you if you look at the people we think he had affairs with before Bessie Blunt, Elizabeth Blunt, mm -hmm. we notice that Elizabeth Blunt is an exception. She was single. So mm -hmm. there's sort of a responsibility for him to claim the child, to get her married, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But mm -hmm. once we get to marry, he's learned from that. Mm -hmm. He's not going to start an affair with a woman who's not married. Right. He doesn't want all the illegitimate ch children running around, right? Yeah. He's yeah. going to threaten his power. And he's already got the son. We can't say for sure that Mary is having an, uh, you know, an abstinent sexual relationship with her husband or from mm -hmm. her husband. Um, but the timing is certainly suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. And he, so I guess what I'm wondering is um, her husband, it's not like he was away at that point that you could say okay well he wasn't around so it had to be somebody else's or anything like that it no, plausible I mean, liability is pretty high there for henry yeah i mean oh, and william is there william's at court he's in the privy chamber he is protecting the king's person the king's yeah. body yeah. uh he's, so he's there he's part of the uh festivities we know he's playing tennis with henry there are records of him having games at richmond with henry um it would certainly be hard to prove. Right, right. But right. we can always look at the circumstances and think, that's a little suspicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I, I guess I just wonder like how, why these provisions were even made for her if it seemed like it, like she was married, like why would you even think that it was Henry's? Um, and, and that's just, I'm, I'm just kind of curious where 
the rumors even came from. Um, mm -hmm. I think having her in such a public, dis on public display, like yeah. we saw with the pageant, mm -hmm. I think it's really hard not to put them together. Sure, sure. I do. I think it would be really hard. Yeah. Everyone saw it. Yeah. <laughs> so then poor William dies. Mm -hmm. And was it of the sweat or? Yeah, he yeah. gets the sweating sickness. Right. And was it in that that massive outbreak when Anne got the sweating sickness too? Do you do you know or was it different? That's a really good question. I'm not sure if it's the same time period, mm -hmm. although I know Cardinal Wolsey comes down with it too. Yeah, never mind. That's just it a might be. <laughs> <laughs> I, just I don't know scared. for sure. <laughs> so then she um then she tries to, she talks about potentially coming back and living in the family home. And her father says no to that. What, do we know what happened there? <laughs> I don't really understand the relationship between Mary and her father, Thomas. It is incredibly difficult to pinpoint when and how Thomas likes her. Okay. That's kind of sad. Um, there mm -hmm. are moments when she really needs help, when she really needs a place to live like this, like when her husband has died and she's got children. Mm -hmm. um, most, most specifically, she's taking care of Catherine at this point. Henry becomes a ward of the crown. Um, so she's got this daughter. It's his granddaughter. Yeah. She's saying, can I come live with you? I have no money. Yeah. And he, he refuses her. Mm. And what, what people have kind of put forth is maybe there was some shame in, again, having a royal affair that, that doesn't pan out. Trying and failing to elevate your status in that way. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, that, that argument doesn't hold up because she was already married. Yeah, yeah. So her status was what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really sure yeah. about that yeah People are a really toxic relationship the two of them isn't that sad um yeah i think it is um and isn't it funny that 500 years later here are two strangers trying to analyze the family <laughs> dynamics of this father and daughter the family tensions over the <laughs> dinner table exactly. mm, i wonder what that was like <laughs> And so she doesn't, well, where does she go then? What, what does she, how does she take care of her daughter? She actually ends up convincing or not convincing, but she goes to Henry VIII directly. And I think it's important to know this, or she goes through Anne. Mm -hmm. It's like an improper kind of conversation. Okay. She goes to her sister and she says, I need help. I need shelter. I've been turned away from my family home. Uh, and Henry VIII actually steps in and requires Thomas Boleyn to take Mary and Catherine into his home. Wow. And at the same time, he grants Mary um, an annuity um, or a yearly salary of um, like a hundred pounds. Initially, it would have belonged to her husband. So mm -hmm. it would have transferred to her son mm -hmm. or back to the crown, not necessarily to Mary. Right. So it's significant that he advocates for her. He steps in on a family matter. Yeah. And then he gives her a royal annuity yeah. on top of it, which is another thing to consider when you think about maybe he's thinking about Catherine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> So, um, so then she does something scandalous and she oh, yes. marries without permission. Tell mm. me about that. This is good stuff because this goes right back to when she started her time in, in French court, when she's serving Mary Tudor um, in France. And we see at the end of Mary Tudor's tenure after the French king has died. She elopes with Charles Brandon. And this sets a precedent. It's not the first elopement. You can go back to Catherine Valois and Owen Tudor if you want to, and it's certainly not the last. Mm -hmm. um, both of Jane Grey's sisters are also known to have eloped. So there is a precedent. It happens. It's not frequent. Mm -hmm. But Mary has seen it be successful, and the reason she sees it be successful is because uh, the, the people who were involved in the elopement are in elevated positions of power. Okay. So she knows that it's her second marriage. Mm -hmm. She can maybe make her own choices. 
she knows she can kind of get out of it or mm -hmm. justify it. We'll talk about justification and her rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and so she marries William Stafford in 1534, and this is her second marriage. She does it with no royal permission. And as a member of the royal family at that point, that was a no-no. <laughs> right, right. Interesting. And so then she does, like you mentioned, she has to beg for forgiveness and yeah. to be restored to favor. Tell me about that letter, which is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people understand that this letter exists. She writes a petition. She addresses it to Thomas Cromwell, um, who is Henry VIII's acting secretary at this point in time. And she is basically asking for mercy or forgiveness. Um, and this letter is so special because not only is it the only letter written by Mary that survives, mm -hmm. we know there's a large body of letter writing happening, but this is the only one that survives. Um, so we get to hear her voice very specifically. Yeah. Um, and it's not really even the content of the letter that I find interesting, but rather the way that it is constructed. Okay. Um, I love Mary here because she's bold. She's admitting that she did something wrong, but at absolutely no point in that letter does she apologize for it. Mm -hmm. So she's saying in a voice that most people don't attribute to her. She's saying very confidently, we know we broke the rules and we're really happy about it anyway. Yeah. But could you please forgive us? Yeah. <laughs> and this is, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. It really is. Um, and she's using really interesting language. Mm -hmm. If we go back to French court, we see women using similar language and the art of correspondence, the art of letter writing is yeah. so crucial to the way that women wield influence. Mm -hmm. um, if you know your audience and you know it's going to be read out loud yeah. um, or in some dramatic manner, yeah. um, then you can very confidently write in your own voice, with your own words, or with words that will appeal to the person you're writing to. Mm -hmm. So we see with Mary this really interesting letter writing pattern where she's using strong words like um, liberty and bondage and love. And it's all this really interesting rhetoric that you're also going to find and heavy reform-based materials from the period. Mm -hmm. So we know that reform language is part of Mary's vocabulary. It comes naturally to her, but she also knows how to use it to influence Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn in her favor. She was a smart cookie. I think she's a really smart cookie. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I never can quite get over the fact that she doesn't apologize. Mm -hmm. That is so bold yeah. to have committed a treasonous act mm -hmm. and then justify it, which yeah. again brings us into the idea of the reform writers like William Tyndale, who Henry VIII is reading at this time. Um, the idea that even though we're all going to sin, mm -hmm. we should be allowed to come back to our God or to our leader and be forgiven mm -hmm. if we acknowledge the sin. Right. Um, so the letter is just dripping with reform, but it's also just full of personality. And I love it. Mm, that's awesome. We'll have to <laughs> include a, a link to the text of the letter. Um, yeah. Yeah. Please. It's yeah. a good one. <laughs> so, um, and so then how did it, how did that end? How did, how did all of that end for her? Mary, um, we don't have a response to that, but we do know um, just based on her circumstances that there is an amount of grace extended to her. Mm -hmm. um, again, with her children being placed in positions at court, there's still some favor there. Um, and then on top of it, we certainly know that her father remains at court, although his time is sort of like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, but he's always there. So the Boleyn family, at least those who are alive <laughs> by the late 1530s, um, you know, they're, they're still in favor. Yeah. It's remarkable. 
Yeah. Did she live for a long time then after that point or like? No, she doesn't live very long. I mean, was it like the mid 1540s or something that she I'm feeling 1540s I think she dies before Henry VIII does yeah um which which is also why it was important for her children to be taken care of yeah um but I don't know the exact date of that yeah but so her last years she was still in favor and it and it seems like it all kind of worked out for her then mm -hmm. she inherits um she inherits her father's home um, and a state, and she's allowed to live there for the remainder of her life. Uh, Again, not a small favor. With her husband, with the new husband? With Stafford, yes. yes. And, and then, of course, he doesn't last very long either. Okay. But that is the Tudor period. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tricky time, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm trying to see if I have any... Um, well, it's funny. It's interesting that you have a background in musical theater because I wanted to ask you about pageants and entertainment, but maybe what I would oh, right. really like, I've actually been wanting to do an episode on William Cornish and uh, the mystery of whether there were two William Cornishes and just one in like the pageants and, you know, the, the William Cornish of the Eaton Choir book versus the William Cornish of the Chateau Vert. And so sure. maybe can I ask you a request? Will you come onto my podcast sometime and talk to me about pageants? Yeah. Because I wanted well, to ask you that too, but that's like a whole different world. Oh, I would love that. Okay. I would absolutely love that. That is, this. that's how this started, really, was okay. I found out that Mary was in this pageant. And I was like, why does everyone pretend like Anne was the main part of this pageant? And then from there, it just snowballed. And I was doing theater and propaganda and pageantry. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because just a couple of weeks ago, I started to write this episode on pageants and I thought, I wish I could find an expert because that would save me a lot of research. So will you be my pageant expert sometime? I would love that. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. I, that's great. I'll have to schedule that, something like that with you then. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, so then where can people find your work and find out more about you? You have a YouTube channel. You do all kinds of stuff. So tell me about it. So my thesis, which is what we're working off of um, quite a bit today, which is where I my sources, my interpretations, and a whole lot more yeah. <laughs> information. Um, my thesis hasn't been published for the public, but it is published on like WorldCat um, or like ProQuest, I think carries it. So if you have you know, a university affiliation, you can do that. Um, but if you want to contact me, I can also send that to you because it's copyrighted. So okay. you can cite it and use it and do whatever you want. Okay. Um, and then I run Untitled History Project. Yeah. And that this last season has been focused on the tutors. So we've been having a lot of fun with that. Just short episodes about my favorite things about the tutors and you know, quick. We've got and like the greatest on. Tudor mysteries on there. Was Edmund Tudor really the father and all of that? Yeah. yeah. More, more DNA questions. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we'll add links to all of that um, somewhere down above where on this page. There will be <laughs> links. Um, awesome. And any any of the other any of the other places people can you do you have a website twitter anything like that where people can reach out to i'm you? on twitter um i love to share and do history twitter community things i'm at miss christine mo so okay. you can find me there or on instagram awesome. um and then youtube and facebook for my videos awesome. um awesome. and i'm writing some articles so you may see that soon awesome <laughs> Well, you are fabulous. I love you. Thanks. So love you too. <laughs> thank you so much for, for sharing and being so generous with your time and telling us so much about Mary Boleyn. You've definitely uh, opened my eyes to another perspective. And I love seeing her as this strong woman and not just this manipulated person that is just owned by her family. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I thank you for letting me talk about her. She's my absolute favorite subject. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you.